con sabor, quesos colombianos y venezolanos, todo hecho en tu casa, con sabor zuliano y calor humano. Los quesos en casa tienen vitaminas rápidos de hacer, en porque cocina, tan fácil como pelar mandarinas. Quesitos en casa, fáciles de hacer son, el doctor quesero te enseña con sabor. Quesitos en casa, fáciles de hacer son, el doctor quesero te enseña con sabor. A lo que su hermano, también queso pera. Costeño en matera, pay, papel y suya, y hasta doble crema. Quesitos en casa, fáciles de hacer son, el doctor quesero te enseña con sabor. Quesitos en casa, fáciles de hacer son, el doctor quesero te enseña con sabor. Hi everyone, welcome once again to my YouTube channel, Doctor Quesero TV, and to my program Ask the Cheese Doctor. This is the English version of my Spanish program. Um, that I do every Saturday at 10 a.m. And I'm going to change the schedule. And I'm going to change the hour. I'm going to do it uh, at 10.30, okay? Because uh, now that the program is, is taking only half an hour, um, there's no point to make it one hour. And I mean, to make it at 11, all of us, Having to do this type of in this um, this type of the year um, at this time of the year, uh, this December, everybody is doing stuff for Christmas, and um, as I said, um, I'm going to take only half an hour, maybe 45 minutes, if we have questions on the show. Okay, and as always, we always speak about a topic in cheese making. So, um, if you want to learn how to make cheese. You're, you're in the right place. And I also have my English course. Sorry. <laughs> I also have my making course. And I'm going to put you the link here just if you want to um, have a look. The course is in five languages. It's in English. It's in Spanish. I'm, I'm a Spanish speaker, so this is my native language. So um, all the videos are in Spanish, but they are captioned in English, Chinese, Hindi, and Arabic. So if you want to learn and live in these latitudes, uh, and you can go. Have this is a link that I'm putting the link here in the comments. So um, can uh, you, you can have a look. And if you don't, I would. I'm gonna do it at, uh, at the end of the presentation. And go to the to the to the link so you can you can have a look about how how the course what includes and everything. And um, Let's see if we have we have connected. If you want to say hello, you're more than welcome. Okay, and I'm going to answer as well the questions of my audience. And today we're going to speak about a very important, topic, which is health and safety. <clears throat> When we make cheese, we have to make a safe cheese for the consumer. And this the consumer might be our family or our, our customers. So the idea is that you can learn how to make a product. If um, in the last show I had a program, uh, I had problems with my audio. You can comment here if you're watching the show, I see people connected. If you can give me your feedback, if the um, audio is okay, please let me know. Or if it is wrong, let me know as well so I can change it. Because I'm using a external mic. Um, but if you see the conversation like just cut, it comes and go, let me know so I'll put the mic of the computer. Um, okay, let's go and start. Uh, let me share the screen <coughs> and, and see the presentation. Okay? As I said, the, the, this program is, uh, is going to be three parts. It's going to be three parts because it's not, and we only have. Split it in three parts so you can understand everything correctly. Okay. As I said, um, how to make cheese, <coughs> how to make cheese safely, okay? the safe way. When we make cheese, especially if you are working in our kitchen, that we don't take too much care about the sanitary kitchen and making and um, having a, a, a very 
a strict sanitizing protocols is important when we make cheese because if we don't make, if we don't have this protocol, <coughs> it might be contaminated. Um, sometimes um, it's a good. I mean, it's a common practice in within our kitchen that we use like a cloth to clean everything. What we do in this case with this in this cloth is spreading the the by not the bacteria and all the pathogens from one place to the other. We need to do this protocol, and I'm gonna tell you how to do it. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, when we make cheese. Uh, uh, Okay, this sorry about that. I try, I thought I, I translated it. Okay, how to know that our cheese is safe? It should be in English, but I don't know what happened here. Let me see what happens. Anyway, how to know that my cheese is safe? We have to make lab test. Okay, and um, sorry about the, the Spanish words. I always translated it, but I don't know what happened today. Um, how to know that my cheese is safe? In theory, we have to make lab tests for every batch, but this is kind of expensive, okay? So, um, and it's not practical because our cheese is going to be too expensive, especially if we are selling cheese. And to do it at home, we normally we're not going to take, we're not going to send our cheese to the lab because it's costs money. So what we need to do is have like a system in place, which is called HACCP. This is the, the acronym of the Hazard Analysis or Appraisal of Critical Control Point. What means is that when we are making any type of product, when we are manufacturing cakes, um, when we are cutting meat, we are making cheese, making yogurt, um, um, cooking vegetables or cooking food, we have to follow a system. And this system, HACCP, is um, what, what, this system, what this system does is to get the critical points of the manufacturing process. And the idea is to control them. So, um, what I mean here, the, the, uh, and this is what we normally do. This is the current trend. We, in this, pro in, this uh, in any manufacturing process, we try to avoid the problem, okay? And um, by including a mitigation procedure, okay? Um, what this system does is to control all the critical parts of the manufacturing process, okay? Uh, each Pro, um, each process or each um, food, let's say, let's say it like this, each food have a critical, have a different critical control point or, or control point. When we might, when we cut meat, we have different procedures. I mean, we have different con a control points into the system. But we're going to focus in cheese making because this is our niche. Of cheese making, okay. So, and the idea is when we are making cheese, okay, in our case, we have to identify the risk during the whole process. Since, we, since the moment that we open the plant, because we might sleep and have an, ac have an accident, until we close, the, we close the plant again. Oh, if we are making cheese, if we are making cheese at home, since the moment that we enter to our kitchen, we are exposed to hazards. We can slip into the into our kitchen if the if the floor is wet, and you we, we can cut with a um, knife or with a thermometer, especially if, if this thermometer have this point, uh, this steel of point, uh, this point of steel, of stainless steel, and we can have an accident and and just um. Uh, get hurt with a thermometer. I mean, the risk is there, and we have to. Uh, the idea is to mitigate the the, the the hazard. Maybe our milk is not cold enough, and because it's not cold enough, all the back pathogens, bacteria, might start to reduce. Or if it is not pasteurized, we'll have 
E. coli or have pathogens like aftos, like many hides, anything that might harm our body or our family or customers as well. Okay, so the idea is to identify this risk and establish a control procedure. A mitigate, this is called a mitigation procedure. The idea is to, mini, uh, to mitigate the risk to, in order to get a safe product. This is how it works, how the system works. This hazard appraisal critical control point, this is how it works, okay? So the, the, the philosophy of the system is to identify the risk, put a control measure to, and minimize the risk. If we're gonna get a safe product. That's the idea, okay? Okay, and this is a of attention, okay? And I'm gonna explain you today too, because it's very long, the, the, uh, we have seven, we're not gonna have, um, we're gonna too long to identify the whole seven. So today, we wanna, I'm gonna explain you two in detail, and next week, we're gonna explain two more, and the third program, we're gonna explain all the, the, the three, the remaining three, okay? So um, before I continue, if you are, um, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, um, I would appreciate it, and, and if you like, if you like what you see so far, just like us in the in the program, so you too can carry on and show my the video to everyone, and and everyone can learn as well. Okay, so um, and let me see if you if if to have a feedback about the um, about the audio. I don't want to have. Let me see if we have. Uh, let me. me if you can comment on it, I would appreciate it. There's no comment. Uh, I don't know if you if you can comment about the audio. I appreciate it. Have problem last program. Uh, no problem. No, okay, I assume that everything is fine. Okay, let's carry on with the presentation. Okay, wait. What happened? Let me see. Okay. Okay. So, so the first aspect when we make the first aspect to to control the identification. So the identification of possible risks that are associated to our production. Okay. In in the in specifically in cheese making, we have uh, we have, for example, um, one of the of this aspect can be the collection of our raw materials, milk, cultures, rennet, and other salt um, condiments to put the bacteria, I mean to condiments to um, to mix it with the curd, um, citric acid, okay, and also the um, disinfectants, bleach, ammonium quaternarium, um, um, so um, this type of raw material that we normally use when we make cheese, okay, um, in the milk, for example, we check what is are associated to the milk if our milk is raw or is uh, needs to be if it is raw there is a hazard because by being raw we'll have um, um pathogens like e coli like salmonella listeria that can affect our production so we have to mitigate this risk so um how if the milk is wrong, we have to pasteurize it, okay? And, it's, and this will establish a, 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 the, a, um, the control, this is another point, okay? In this aspect, we just, we just identify the hazard, okay? Um, for example, in the manufacturing process, we might get cross-contamination in, in the manufacturing process. For example, if our kitchen or if our plant is not correct, 
effectively sanitized, we're going to have contamination with Streptococcus aureus, with Salmonella, Listeria, and um, bacteria that are the, uh, also, uh, also Bactrophage, which is a virus that attacks the milk. And our product will not be safe, or our milk will not get acidified. Okay? Um, so, but in theory, we can have um, a possible cross contamination during the manufacturing process, and we have to mitigate this, and we have to identify this possible hazard also and not only with them with the bacteria the cross contamination maybe the, our uh, if our gear is not correctly stopped for example and we can have an accident we can sleep if the floor is very polished is very smooth and we're using um, um shoes with um with gum um or gum boots but they are not with a surface, with a rough surface, we might slip into the plant and have an accident and hurt our head or, or I mean, we can have an accident. So we have to take care of, of all these situations and identify the risk due, during the manufacturing process, okay? We are distributing our product and we, also, we are using a truck. And for example, if the, if the, the truck that we are using, we had a dog, at the back, this dog is gonna contaminate. It's gonna, it's gonna have, we'll have cross contamination uh, with our product. If, um, if the product is not enough, we might have another hazard or, uh, or another possible hazard. So, um, um, if our truck or our coolers, in the, I'm talking about the distribution part. If our cooler are not cold enough cheese especially is if it is fresh or our job or whatever whatever the dairy product we are making might get hot and therefore the bacteria will start would start to reproduce and maybe um we can uh, have um unacceptable parameters um, of of stococcus aureus to put an example which is a type of bacteria that contaminate the cheeses so we have um we have to identify in this three part of the process uh, of, the man, of the whole manufacturing process what risk are we, uh, do we have to take care of okay. I just identify first I say and, and we have to do it like establishes all the processes um, all the steps of the process in the cheese making case we have to first sanitize our equipment, our, our equipment what hazard might be there uh, to receive the milk? What hazard might be there? Heat the milk. What hazard might be there, and so on. So we have to identify each step of the process and identify the, pro the, the possible risk that we might have. Okay, this is the first point: identifying the possible hazard. Okay? The second one would be the determination of the size point in the process where there is a real risk that can be controlled, okay? If the risk can be controlled, we say that is a control point. But if the risk cannot be controlled or minimized, we say that this is a critical control point and we compulsorily have to um, mitigate it, okay, to the minimum. If we don't mitigate the risk to a minimum, to change our process to make it minimum okay otherwise our system don't work and i'm going to put an example for example the if we are our milk is for sure contaminated with e coli for sure it will also have, or might have antibiotics it will also or it would also have streptococcus aureus maybe listeria or salmonella, we never know. Maybe aftos, okay? Um, and the only way to avoid the milk to be harmful to, the, to, to our health is pasteurizing it. So pasteurization and write it down as a, as, a, as, a, as a tip, pasteurization is a critical control point during the, the cheese making process. 
if you, for example, um, you don't want to pasteurize your milk, okay? You don't want to pasteurize it. And you can use, and you want to use already pasteurized milk, yeah, and now you are already mitigating the risk because your milk is, is coming already pasteurized from the manufacturer. So in this case, you already mitigated the, the, the hazard of the pasteurization because you are buying pasteurized milk. In my case, for example, I buy pasteurized milk because it takes me longer, because I have a small equipment, it takes me longer to pasteurize the milk. It takes me about one hour, one hour and a half to heat it at the pasteurization temperature and then cool it down. So it takes one hour that I can use in making cheese. So for me, it's cheaper to buy already pasteurized milk. But if you are buying, for example, 5,000 liters of milk, if you, to pasteurize it, I mean, buy 5 liters, 5,000 liters of pasteurized milk, it's very complicated, so you know, and it's very expensive. So you have to, in this case, you can buy raw milk and pasteurize it yourself. But you have to know if your milk is, is correctly pasteurized. So, but for now, you need to know that Pasteurization of your milk is one critical control point. Because if you don't pasteurize, for sure your milk will be harmful. So, this, uh, another example is that one procedure into your plant or into your kitchen that if you, this is a, a control point, that if you don't do it, you just I mean the cheese is going to be bad or it's not going to which is hand wash, okay? You can hand wash your hands um, when you're making cheese, but if you, for any reason, you forgot to do it once or twice, it doesn't mean that your cheese is gonna be um, unsafe. And in this case, we call it control point, okay? So, your cheese making process has a lot of steps, and I'm putting it here. The first step is the reception. Well, the first step will be when you enter to the kitchen or when you enter to the plant, to your plant, to, to your cheese plant. You have to sanitize your equipment first, and then in this process, you might have. But oh, um, let's obviate that. The, in general terms, the cheese making process has these steps. The, milk, the first one is the milk reception. So, okay, so we have to determine the, the, determine what um, what points are critical and what points are just control. Okay, so milk receptions. We are receiving the milk. Okay, let's assume that the milk is raw. So we know that it's raw, but the milk should be cold at four degrees because if it is hot. Maybe uh, the quality of the milk will, um, wouldn't be okay. So in this case, we have a control point. We don't have a critical control point because uh, if our milk, if, if, if for any reason is it's a little bit hot, let's say that we have to receive the milk at four degrees, but for any reason you receive the milk at seven degrees, okay, it's not good, but it's not drama. You have okay. You can we can accept it. So we have over there a control point. But then we know that our milk is uh, polluted with pathogens. It's wrong. Pasteurize it. So pasteurization is critical control point. So we have to include. Now write it down in your in your book. The pasteurization is a critical point. We have to pasteurize the milk. How we pasteurize the milk? you choose your the procedure and it comes from 63 degrees for half an hour till 7.9 degrees celsius per one minute you can do whatever you want, and you can work as well in the middle i have a video in my channel about pasteurization all the um, the sequences and time that we can that you can apply okay you can choose one and that's it in case, I choose 69.4 degrees Celsius, on, uh, and I keep this temperature for one minute, and then I cool down. Because waiting one minute 
um, takes me uh, less time, but it's to wait, waiting half hour, okay? So, in heating, you might um, heat another, another process when you heat your milk. Um, when you're heating your milk, you might have hazards over there. For example, if you, what you got is not correctly sanitized, or if you um, if you apply too much hot, you might burn your milk. So if you there is a hazard, it will affect the quality of your product. Okay, once your milk has the right temperature, you're going to not because uh, because you already pasteurized it. Okay, due to the fact that you already pasteurized your milk, you have to inoculate the milk again with the lactic cultures. But there's there's another hazard. For example, you lactic culture might come contaminated. You never know. So you have to. How do you mitigate this risk? You have to keep your lactic culture. Uh, a sterile from the original package and then use it and that's it. If you are using, for example, bulk materials, you, have, you will have to keep your, your um, you have to be, to handle the lactic culture, you have, you have to sanitize your hand first, put it in a sterile container, use it and close the, the rest of the material, separately put it in the fridge, and that, that's the idea, okay? In the maturation process, it's the same, and you have to um, you have to do it um, correctly. Avoid cross contamination if you are maturing, for example, um, white malt cheeses with blue malt cheeses together. You have to separately, otherwise, the blue cheese is going to contain is going to, I mean, the blue malt is going to pass to the white malt. They're going to mix together. And you're gonna have um, cheeses with both malt, so you have to be careful. And, and one, to put an example, one mitigation procedure would be put each type of cheese into containers, because if you're gonna put it in the same fridge, cover it, put it in individual containers, so you can um, avoid the, the, the contamination. In the case of the lactic cultures, if you inoculate your milk, okay, and you are ripening your milk or mashing your lactic cultures, um, you have to avoid, you have to cover the your your vat with something with a lining that needs to be as well sterilized. Or if you are using a pot, you might you might put the lid on. Your lid should have uh, or should be sanitized or what you might get cross contamination um, in um, when we are making cheese in the in our kitchen in our, our plants we might have spores that are floating on the air and Mike if you don't cover your your milk the spores will pass through the milk and eventually your you know your your ripening might affect them the, like the uh, sorry the spores might affect your ripening and so you have to, but, um, but these are control points. These are not critical control points. These are control points. I mean, you choose if you if it is a critical control point uh, or it's a control point. Um, this um, this step that I'm and that I'm giving you for now, except pasteurization, all of them are control points that you need to control. Okay, not critical control point. Pasteurization is the only one uh, for so far but a uh, critical control point okay let's go carry on the, during the process i will tell you there is another critical control point that we have another one we have one more okay so uh, when we coagulate our milk okay we put the rennet there is another another risk when we cut off the milk because our rennet might come as well contaminated so we have to be careful we have to keep it frozen and when we use it Sterilize our hands with alcohol. Manipulate everything. The, if you are if you are going to use um, a spoon, the spoon needs to be sanitized. Otherwise, if the, if the spoon is dirty and you just touch them at the 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 bulk rennet into into the container, you might you will contaminate the remaining the remaining amount. And your future cheeses you will cheese uh, if it is contaminated, 
will uh, urine will be will, uh, urine will contaminate the the future uh, batches of okay so but uh, so this is a control point so we already coagulate our milk we cut our the milk is already coagulated we cut the cord and before we cut it the the cheese the sorry the knife that we are using cut or maybe the the liars that we're using or, or the 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 cord cutters they need to be sanitized because they are dirty and and they, if they are not sanitized if they have spores on it of streptococcus aureus or a ruby plate can whatever if the if the um, the, the curl cutter are not correctly sanitized it will contaminate your your vat so you have to sanitize before you use after you cut it you have to, you have to scald the same when you are when you are scalding you have to steer to uh, to um, allow the senior the synergies to act and your equipment needs to be sanitized once you mold you mold it um, sorry before before you before you uh, mold you have to control pH, pH this, and it's not there the pH is another point okay so um but these are all the steps of the process the mold you have you, you might have hazard here in as well when you salt the milk the, the cheese if your salt is not um if it is kept just in in, in a, for example if you stuck it on the bag and the bag is open and contaminated so you have to put it in a, in, in a safe product so to avoid the cross -contamination. the same with the mature cheese okay and the same with the when you're packing your cheese um once your cheese is ready you're gonna you wait before you pack it up your bag needs to be um stock vacuum so the air doesn't come into the into the um, into the bags and you don't get the the spores of the cocos aureus so the cocos aureus is a pain because um it's then on the air so if you don't that's why we vacuum uh, seal the cheese is by vacuum sealing the cheese there is no air on it and then um, the streptococcus aureus will not reproduce okay so and um, as well when you are when you when you pack it and um, you have to stock it as well and to stock it there's another hazard um which is storage and you pile your cheeses in let's say columns of 10 pieces per per, per row or 10 pieces per column if you put too much weight there the bag might get ripped and the air will come in and it will will um will get contaminated um during the, the shelf time okay and also the distribution of the of the uh of the of the of the, of the, of the steps all the steps we need to consider when we are in, when we are making this analysis we are making the when we are making the the process okay that when we are designing the the hard, the hard analysis uh, critical control point okay well and this is of this is for uh, for now and um, i'm going to i'm going to explain you in the next session to an um, um two more um hazard analysis control point and hazard analysis process what to consider so you and in this way you can make a safe product okay yeah, as i said you take my course my, my english course is gonna be in uh, sorry about that i don't know what happened with the presentation it should be in english but anyway uh, i have the link here i'm gonna put it here so you can see it um it's a speak spanish and hindi okay so let's uh, the, the this information is uh, the video in English. Yeah, I reckon English. Let me see if we can, if, if um, so you can.
team, the formation, and to read everything, okay? And this is what, let me, uh, in the me my message, introduction to the manufacturer of artists and pieces, a little bit of history, the technique, and we're going to make all this, see? We're going to make and 18 cheeses. I have to change this. It's going to be one more. Gonna, which one? Uh, I don't remember. I have to check the list. I have an, uh, okay. So the, the course costs uh, $260 Americans. And you can pay it. You can pay it in monthly payment if you want. Let me. The thing is that is the computer is slow. So, and um, see. If you can pay, you can make a um, monthly payment here. And this is the link. You gonna in, by linking to this URL, you're gonna get um, you're gonna have a meeting with one of my assistants or maybe with me. And we can make like can okay. so you can have a look to all this information just by clicking here, and you will have the um, access to the to the course. These are more than 40 videos um, of, of cheese making. You can do it at your own pace, okay? Um, this is information. Let me see if, if it works. I already tested it, but anyway, just in case. And see. Oh. Zealand cheese school. Here you are. Okay, now let's go with the um, the stop share the screen. Okay, and now um, let's go with the questions. Okay, let me take this out. And let's see. Hi Manal, how are you? How can you? Yeah. Hi Manal, how are you? Um, welcome to my show. And let's see, there's a question from you. Okay, no problem. Uh, Manal, how can, how can I increase the fat in the pasteurized homogenizer? That's very easy, Manal. Thank you for the question. Look, to increase the fat, when we are making cheese, we can increase or decrease the fat content. How do we call that? We call this standardization. Okay, there is a video in my channel. One program, uh, I reckon, is how to standardize the milk. Okay, so this, um, when we are adding the milk, well, sorry, when we are adding cream, we are using the fat content, and we have to do it. There is a, there is a, um, there is a um, method that we call it Pearson square. We have calculated. For example, if your milk is 3.4%, which is normally the, the percentage of the cow's milk in average, 3.4% 3, 3 fat content. And you want to make it to, say, 5% fat content. You have to increase the fat by adding cream to the milk. And this method will tell you how many liters 50% fine to put an example, you have to add. Okay, so the Pearson square tell you how to do. It. Okay, it's a video in my channel how to standardize milk. Go have a look and it will tell you how to do it. Okay, and but this is basically that by if you want to make a cheese with, with a higher fat content, you have to put cream on the, on the, on the milk. If you want to do the other way, if you want, if you have 3.4 fat percent milk and you want to make a cheese 2 percent fat content, you have to add cream. Sorry, you have to add skin milk. Instead of adding cream, you have to add skin milk so you can lower the fat content. Skin milk, 1 percent to put a put number. 2 percent will depend on the fat content that you want. Then you will be making 
um, um, edges with low fat content. One pen would be percent. It will depend on the person square. But in both cases, the person square. Okay, go to my channel in the, in, and look for a video. Okay. Um, yeah, I have questions here. I'm going to answer maybe two questions because we only have half and we'll okay. um, if you want to learn more Manel, you can take my English sorry my my cheese course my cheese making course for beginners and you will have all this information there okay and even more because you're gonna you're gonna have you're gonna be part of a community of cheese makers around the globe and you will be interacting with us and making making questions if you want if you have a question we will answer it to you it's like a coaching program okay? it's not only the um, the video we will be part of the community and we'll resolve all your questions as well okay i'm gonna put the link here if someone wants to have a look okay i'm gonna put here i put it in the comments okay so if you want to link there okay okay i'll answer Sir, one or two questions and then we'll go. Let me see. Uh, uh, maybe if. Okay, here we are. Chris. Chris is asking. I see you here. So you'll be here. Just got Gavin Weaver's parmesan in you know, ripening box. He stays to age for three months at 85, 90 degrees humidity. The question I have is, will it mold? And if so, do I want to find a solution? Well, look, I saw Gavin Weaver's um, Parmesan recipe, okay. But Parmesan style cheese doesn't ripe for three months. If you want to make a good Parmesan cheese, you have to ripen for at least 18 months, at least. So you're gonna have a very piquant um, Parmesan. If you ripen for only three months, you're gonna get a cured cheese. It's mature cheese, it's not a biggie. Parmesan cheese is crumbly and it's very hard. And this is, you can, you achieve the, the, this hardness is during 18 months. Not, not in three months. First question. Second question. Um, the second part of the question. For sure, your cheese will become moldy. It will have mold. You have to maintain it. You have to clean it. You can clean it with brine solution. That is correct. But you can also use vinegar. Okay? What I do is I mix both. I use brine solution, 20%, and I put a little bit of vinegar to create uh, acid surface on the on the cheese on the ex, ex, in the rind, and um, the rind the the the, um, the brine will help the the rind to to become hard. So um, you both okay. Clean it with a with, with clean it with um with a cloth and turn it over. And during the first week, you have to turn it every day until you get your dry rind. When your rind is dry and dry to the to the touch, you can turn it three times a week, and then your cheese will become harder and harder. Okay, and it will develop more again. So you have to maintain it along the way. After that, you can vacuum pack it. Okay, after let's say six months or four months, you will decide that. You can vacuum pack it, but your brine is already hard, so you're not gonna have more mold and put into the into your cave for the rest of the time. You can also wax it if you want, okay? Because waxing, what, what it does is um, to, to, avoid the, to, to avoid the cheese to become drier and also to avoid the cheese to get humidity. So you um, by vacuum packet you can uh, and or wax it, 
you 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 are guaranteed that the fat the, the, the moisture content of the cheese will remain during the process. Okay, and your your ripening process will be correct. Okay, but this uh, but don't do it for three months. Do it at least at least for twelve months. Um, I'm gonna make in my cheese course. I'm gonna make it Parmesan, Sal, of course, because Parmigiano Reggiano is from Parma, Italy, and these are the only cheeses that can that might they have to be called Parmesan, Parmesan. And uh, the other ones are Parmesan style. Okay. Okay. Another question is, um, let's see, Caroline. Hi, Doctor Cresero. I have. I have a new big question. I can I can food and ferment different things like pickles, sauerkraut, kimchi, etc. Any sign of mold is absolutely catastrophic to the project. Cheese making doesn't seem to be concerned about mold at all. In fact, in some cases, seems to embrace it. Why? Well, look. When we are making cheese. Mold is a very common issue, so we don't get worried. We just maintain the cheese, clean the mold. It will depend on the type of mold that we have. If we are making, and coming back to the last question, Parmigiano Reggiano or Parmigiano Parmigiano Reggiano style cheese or Parmesan style, style cheese, we are making, we are getting mold along the way, so we have to clean it. It's not a biggie. Okay, we clean it. And we carry on with the process. And if, if you are using pickles and stuff, okay, this mold will affect the quality of your of your pickles or whatever the, the, the food that you are using. That's why we use it dry. When we are using pickles, we dry them up first and then put into the cheese. We can also use cumin or we can use um, peppers. We use, normally we use dry product. We can also use fruits, dry fruits as well, like like um, raspberries. For example, if we're making Wensleydale, we use raspberries. Uh, we can use strawberries as well, but also all, always dry. The cheese is wet, and if we put it in dry, we're gonna create more more motion record, and we can have and the um, the pickles might have might be contaminated because wet. And they have mold, and the mold maybe would affect. I'm not saying that it will. It would affect the quality of the milk, of the of the, of the of the cheese. But if we are taking care of the mold by cleaning it, maintaining it, and taking it away, there's no biggie. When we are making cheese with, um, we are using mold as an ingredient. For example, if we, if we are using blue mold, we will have this problem. Okay, um, but the mold is beneficiary. It's beneficiary because the um, it's beneficial. Sorry, the mold is beneficial because it will help to ripen the cheese. It will change the texture and it will improve the flavor. Okay, I hope I have answered your question. Okay, that's it. That's that's all. Um, we have forty eight minutes. Okay, um, so see you next week. And now goodbye. See you next week as well. And then if you want if you want to take the report, I just left the link over there. And if you if you if you if, if it's very hard to pay in one in, in one for one payment, you can make monthly pay payments if you want. And as a matter, just click on the link that I just already show you in the red letters at the end of the of the landing page. You will can get um, like a call. I will call you, or my my assistant will call you. Yeah, arrange a month plan as your wish. Doesn't matter. I'm nine is only sixty dollars. My interest is that you learn, not that to get the money. I mean, the money is right. It's about important part, but I prefer to that you can you can learn and spread the voice that you will learn how to make. <laughs> okay. Um. As I said, next week the pro will be at ten thirty. Okay, at 10 30. Um, yeah, 10 30. It will be my program and it will last half an hour. So you guys can um, make the arrangement and your, your time. And see you next week.
and a salad. Um, eat cheese because like without cheese, it's like love without a kiss. <laughs> so, ah, by the way, if you're taking the course, you you are participating in a giveaway of a fresh cheese kit. Okay, and all the all the students that take the course and register, to, and we will on the twenty fifth of December, New Zealand time, in my program. And it's gonna be a special program because I close activities in work on the fifteenth. By 25th, I'm going to make the giveaway. I'm going to, I'm going to do the giveaway and, and show the winner of the of the participant. Okay. okay. See you next week and, and start it up. Quesitos en casa, fáciles de hacer son. El doctor quesero te enseña con sabor. Quesitos en casa, fáciles de hacer son. El doctor quesero te enseña con sabor. Quesos colombianos y venezolanos, todo hecho en tu casa. Con sabor zuliano y calor humano. Los quesos en casa tienen vitaminas rápidos de hacer. En cualquier cocina, tan fácil como pelar mandarinas. Quesitos en casa, fáciles de hacer son. El 